guys, I'm Cory Oliver. Thanks for watching the Coriolis Effect. Please hit the subscribe button below, and we hope you like this episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Aqua 9 Plus All Natural Ionic Mineral Alkaline Drinking Water. Aqua 9 Plus is one of the first and only all natural ionic mineral bottled drinking waters in the world. It has one of the highest and most stable pH of any bottled water on the market, with a pH ranging from 9.5 to 10. And I gotta tell you, besides tasting great, high alkaline water has so many positive health benefits. It increases your endurance, it deactivates pepsin in the body, which helps reduce the occurrences of upset stomachs, it neutralizes pesticides and fungicides on produce, it increases oxygen delivery throughout the body, and it helps reduce heartburn and indigestion. When you consider that coffee can have a pH as low as 2, which is very acidic, that pH can be neutralized by using high pH water. And a medical study has suggested that alkaline ionized water may have benefits for people with high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. Uh, you can go to aquanineplus.com. That's A-Q-U-A-N-I-N-E-P-L-U-S.com to find the nearest store that sells Aquanine Plus all-natural ionic mineral alkaline drinking water. They also sell a home water system which produces purified ionic mineral 9.5 plus pH drinking water naturally directly in your home without the use of electricity. And you wow, can also that's cool. Yeah, and you can also find filling stations at local grocery stores. If you go to their website, uh, aquanineplus.com, they'll tell you where the nearest filling station is near you. So you go there with a five-gallon jug or a two-gallon jug. Pay your money, and it fills it up, and it lasts for a couple of weeks. Uh, there's actually one at Air One. There's all the Air Ones. It's a great, it's a great water. It's really great water. It actually tastes great. We have, we are grateful to have them on the show and and supporting us. Yes. But I also love their water. No, their water tastes great. Hi guys, it's Corey Oliver with the Coriolis Effect, and today I want to talk a little bit about one of our sponsors, Lightsport.com. Uh, we feel blessed enough to have this company as one of our sponsors. They're a great company. They're faith-based. Uh, it's flightsport.com. They have a, many, many, many supplements. They have a t-shirts. They have clothing. Uh, but these are some of my favorite products that I've been using for almost a year. Um, I started using them during COVID, and I'm taking them still. This is the Super Greens, which is yummy. Bob, it's yummy. I'm try it right now. I'm going to take it right now. Okay. You take literally a capful. And it tastes great, and you're getting your daily supplement of greens, and it's so good. Your body craves it, oddly really? enough. Yes. Like I drink mine after my meal in the morning, um, and I feel so good. Wow. You're just getting a ton of stuff, all your reds. Uh, beet root juice, blueberry extract, papaya, fruit jack, organic raspberry leaf. Raspberry is very good for you. As uh, are the all other of the other things. Ingredients. Sour cherry fruit, which is kind of tastes like that. Cranberry, it's good for your kidneys. Cranberry fruit, um, juice. Elderberry, that's excellent for your immune system. Pomegranate, uh, it's just filled. It's packed with a punch, a reds punch. So I can't say enough about this. This will give you a little bit of energy, and you're getting your reds in it. Um, I highly recommend flightsport.com all in one swoop. I mean, that was like took me less than a minute to, yes. to get all the good stuff. And that's once a day? And once a day, yeah. And they've got a lot of different products, so I encourage you to just visit their site and uh, check them out. And they're wonderful people. And, and they, how would they, they really find them? Flight, they're at flightsport.com. <laughs> I'm, I'm tongue-tied, so flightsport.com. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Corey. How are you? I'm doing well, and I'm very excited about today's guest, as I always say, because I'm excited in general. Uh, we do have uh, Fox 11's Maria Quiban White Sale on oh, today, very nice, very nice. and she's just a beautiful person. I'm excited to get to know her and read about her book. Yeah. Uh, before she comes in, I want to talk to you. My <laughs> my wife listened to the Burt Ward interview, and in the beginning, you know, I tell a little story about my wife, and I thought it was funny. She said, "Could you please not talk about me on the podcast?" I said, "Okay, honey, I promise I won't talk about the podcast." By uh, that being said. So the other night she comes in the room. Okay, you and says, are not talking about her. No, she. I. This is, has to be talked about. You know, the whole issue was cleaning the bathroom between the yes, two rooms. Yes, I remember. I took to, her right, side. Right. <laughs> so we used to have a nice lady who come over and clean the house every two weeks and everything else. But we've been indoors for a while, so yeah. Uh, Irene, Irene had decided she would just do the cleaning. So then it got to uh, the bathroom, and I said, "Look," or we said, "We used to pay the maid X amount of dollars." I said. She said, well, pay me $40, I clean your bathroom. I said, hey, look, I'll pay you $40 every week if you don't clean my bathroom. 
So that's going to be our new thing is I'm going to pay my wife $40 a week just not, not to, to clean, clean my bathroom. bathroom. Yeah, just leave, And it will be money well spent. Okay, well, yeah. I just want to say, I'm staying at this. <laughs> I can say, honey, this is an oral contract enforceable in a court of law. <laughs> you get $40, well, $40 every two weeks to not clean two? my bathroom. Okay, well, I'm going to negotiate for her. Really? You know, 10%? It's like a week. $40 a week. Okay, 40, yeah, you get $40 a week to not clean my bathroom. You're welcome, Irina. I just got you two more weeks. <laughs> You're and, hilarious. And if anybody wants to comment on whether it should be higher or lower or whether I'm an idiot, go ahead, please. Be well, because the interesting thing is, and I'll, I'll do this really quickly, she cleaned the entire house for like a month. Your house it, is spotless, by the well, way. That's, that's all my wife. That's all my wife. I don't clean. So... She cleans the house for a month and does a room uh, every couple days and does this whole thing. And I thought, okay. And she read this or listened to this article or did something about how creating this creates a better aura and technically brings money into the family and, and it just creates a positive. Okay, so whatever. So we were doing, a, like, we had three days we did a podcast or three, I'm sorry, three podcasts on one day. We came downstairs and I was on the phone and I was in the living room. I never go in the living room. And I saw a glass half full of water in the living room. I said, okay, so I'm walking around, I grab the glass, I empty it in the sink, I put it on there. While I'm on the phone, she comes to me, irate. Where's the glass of water? I said, I threw it out. I said, go get another glass of water. She didn't talk to me for an entire day. Appar I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> she does not want you to talk about your, her, and uh, we're talking about her this uh, whole time. Irina, I love you. Apparently, this glass of water was the end of the month ritual. The most important <laughs> thing, she actually... Most said important you know, thing. yeah she she had it out for 24 hours and she said i said she said some kind of prayer over but i think it was more like a incantation you drank it of, no i just threw it out because i saw half of that door <laughs> and she screamed i mean she was mad she literally didn't talk to me she said you never clean the house you clean that room that day you never walk into that room and well, here's the thing i think you should pay her 40 dollars um Every time you see an empty glass of water or a half glass full of water. So there you go. <laughs> we all over the house. She's going to be rich before the end of this show. So the end of the story is we've decided that every time I help, it winds up hurting. And I have the best of intentions. Of I figure, okay, you do. Yeah, but apparently it always goes wrong. I know. You two so. are very cute, though. I will say you have a very funny, cute, sweet relationship. And so, I'm... so, honey, I know you're listening to this. I will not clean anymore. I promise. I will not try to help you anymore because I know that I just screw up every time. Oh, you're hey, doing let's, that. let's go on with the show. Okay. Hey, let's start the show. Let's start the show. Yes. Um, welcome to the Coriolis Effect. I am Corey Oliver, and I am excited Aww. about today's guest. Um, I'm just sitting here staring across at her, and she's just so beautiful inside and out. And you have um, a message, and you have uh, somehow, through all of this pain that you've gone through, you've turned your pain into your purpose. You and your husband's pur purpose. Um, you are the author of a uh, You Can't Do It Alone, A Widow's Journey Through Loss, Grief, and Life After. Um, you are a news anchor at Fox News Goodale. Yep. Morning News. Uh -huh. uh, Maria Quibin Whitesell. Am I saying that right? The last name? Whites Whitesell. Whitesell. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. Maria Quibon. Quibon. It's, it's Quibon. like, uh, it's, it's Filipino. You it's know, Filipino, yes. 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 Um, thank you for coming in today. I know that um, this is going to be a really a different turn for this show because we're always, you know, doing these quirky things. And yesterday it was my bad. I thought you were coming in and I had not read your book yet. I had sifted through some notes and this is how God works. Right. I got to read it last night. Yeah. And truly, you're, you're amazing. You, you really have um, Thank you. kept your husband's journey alive. Uh, I'd love to ask you a million questions. I have, but first, I'm but here, first, <laughs> oh, but first, sorry, we have a word of the day. Um, We're gonna play a word. Yes. You're gonna tell us what the word means. You're never gonna get it. No, oh nobody ever gosh. has. But I'm gonna tell you, this is one of the shortest words we've ever had. Okay. And I'll give you a hint. It is a phobia. Glaucophobia. 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 Does that have something to do with your eyes or? Um, I think yeah, kind of. Like like glaucoma. Nope. The fear of... It's... I don't want to say it's particular to you, but you did post something about this fear very of recently. Fear of gray hair? <laughs> exactly what it is. Yep. I know. Yes. Well, you know... Well, it's you fear of gray, like but yeah, it's fear of gray hair. Fear I was fear here. Of gray. Yeah, wow. I was on my way over here, I saw your sweet face come up on my Instagram, and you had posted a TikTok, and it was so cute because you were like, oh, my first gray hair. So on my eyebrow. On your eyebrow. <laughs> on your eyebrow. And and I was cracking up, and so when you went to the 
the ladies room a few minutes ago I said come on Bob we have to do the fear of gray hair oh that's been so so you guys are so fast we're quick here so fast quick here I I, I'm really really happy to be here when I first heard about your show the Coriolis effect I thought we're going to be talking about um weather and the environment and the sun and the earth's axis and uh, so but um but yeah we finally got a meteorologist oh this is (laughs) Coriolis effect is nothing about the weather. <laughs> well, I mean, part of the Coriolis. Well, the Coriolis effect yeah, is yeah. the weather, but yeah. not our show. Actually, now that we have you here, Maria, we need the actual definition because my daughter actually came up with this when I was talking about uh, the waves. And she said, oh, Mom, uh, that's the Coriolis effect. Right, And right. so maybe fill us in a little bit more. Oh, gosh. You're going to talk meteorology and yeah. how the Earth is tilted on its axis and how it spins and really kind of drives the weather because of the way the earth is tilted. So the Coriolis effect um, basically helps dictate our weather as these storm systems move from west to east. And uh, anyway, right. let's talk right to left. Left. <laughs> left to right. I don't want people to change the channel. No, no, no. no they the won't. Scientific okay, stuff. first of all, look at you two. I don't think they're going to change the channel. I, I know. I'm sitting across from you. And, and if you're just listening on a, on a podcast, you're just so beautiful. Inside and out. I keep saying that. Um but I, I, today you are here uh, to talk about the book that you wrote uh, for your late husband, yes. Sean, Sean Whitesell. Mm-hmm. Um, beautiful man, right? Mm-hmm. I know. Mm-hmm. I love that you, um, you've been married three times. He was my third, yeah. Th- yeah. So it was like third time's a charm. <laughs> and it was. You really, truly, I have notes here because I want to do it justice. I know Carlos is kind of a friend of mine, too, for Ed Beyond TV, and I watched your interview. Oh, yes, Carlos Amesqua. Yeah, yes. and... Um, you you said here, um, look, I've got them all kind of, um, y- you had a gift of a timeline with your husband, and you, he really was the love of your life, you know, other than yes. your children, right? And you, like you said, third time's a charm, and I've been married twice, and it's it can be, divorce can be kind of like It is, a it's death. a big loss, yes. yeah, absolutely. Especially if you don't want it. Right. So I kind of, I was reading your book, and I was going through it, and it was very healing for me. Just the different chapters and the different process that you went through. Tell me about, I know you've talked about this a lot, but tell me about um, the moment you first found out in Paris, I believe. That- well, we didn't know then what was wrong, but that was the first time that I really noticed something was wrong with him. Um, you know, like two fa- working parents and a and, and, uh, modern family, we had very busy lives and jobs, and I worked very early in the morning. He would work till late night. He was a writer. He wrote for some of the popular TV shows. I'm sure you are um, maybe know about them, like Cold Case and House and um, Boston Public. So he was just getting on a new show. So we were kind of ships in the night during that that year. He had just turned 50, and our son was three years old. And so we decided, you know what, let's go. He's old enough now to stay home with um, my parents. So let's go to Paris. His brothers had gifted him uh, and us uh, for his 50th birthday a big trip to Paris. We've both never been. So we were on this trip and we were together 24 seven. And I realized that he did not plan out our itinerary like he normally would. He got up late in the morning. That was so unlike him because he would typically be up way before I was and he would work out, go to the steam room or something or, or write a few pages, but he would just sleep. And then I would justify it by like, okay, maybe he started. And each day we were there, um, it would get worse. Like he was more than just forgetful. He uh, couldn't retain the information the tour guide was telling us. And then here's the really last part that, that really got me was he was someone who lived in New York for many years. And the fact that he could not hail a taxi for us mm. was very troubling to me. Mm. And so uh, by the end of that trip, I literally was in tears. And, I, and even he knew. So I made him promise that he would see a doctor, and, and he said, yeah. And, you know, we thought, well, maybe it's just his thyroid medication because he had always had, like, a, a, a low thyroid level. And so we got home, and exactly two weeks after we got home, uh, he went through doctor after doctor, and then we found out that his uh, brain scans, uh, which the doctor had ordered because he thought he was depressed, he had passed everything else. The blood tests were fine. Everything was fine. Um, then they realized they saw these big deep tumors in his brain and and uh multiple or multiple yeah and they were inoperable so he was diagnosed with inoperable incurable brain cancer called glioblastoma and looking back as i was reading your book and i've watched your interviews and one of the questions that came to my mind was did he have any kind of 
you know, knowledge or, or any inclination that anything was wrong. No. He never skipped a beat. So the first no. you noticed it was in Paris. Really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, in hindsight, you know, we uh, we thought about it. Like, how could we have missed this? Could we have found this sooner so that we could have had you longer? I, you know, all those thoughts mm-hmm. run into your, to your mind. And then you, you think back and you go, oh, I remember that time that he had these for- these keys. I remember him coming home and he had keys in his pocket and he put it on the table. And I said, what are those? And he goes, I don't know how I got these keys. They're someone's keys, but they're not mine. Right. And I thought, well, you got home. You obviously got the right key from the valet uh, t- t- to come home with it. But where did you get? So he couldn't remember how he got these keys. Right. I, no idea. So some poor person, like, does not have a set of keys. So I don't know how he got them. He still doesn't know. Wow. But I remember that was really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember a couple times where he would come home and he said, oh, I went to yoga and I, I think I almost passed out. And I was like, what? 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 <laughs> you know? So those kinds of little things uh, we justified by, again, he was working a lot. He didn't get much sleep. He was on a new show. He turned 50. And, and so we didn't really think anything of it at that time. So the moment that you find out, you're crushed, of course. For sure. Crushed. I, mm-hmm. I know. I went mm-hmm. through this with you last night. And this, yeah. while I read your book, I was just, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking and beautiful at the same time. Um, the way that you handled everything. I mean, I just, it blows my mind uh, with such grace and poise. But there is a moment where I was actually watching the interview last night with Carlos on Beyond TV. I keep saying that. Hi, Carlos. Um, <laughs> And you said, and this is a valid emotion, you were angry. Of course. And you were shouting out to God and, and swearing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and I get it. I get those moments. And tell us in that moment maybe how you felt and what you might have heard God say or feel. Or... Well, at that very moment, I remember that uh, clinic or, or that room. It was in the basement of St. John's Hospital. It was the brain surgery center. And even at that time when we were walking into there, we still hadn't, we didn't even think about in any way, shape, or form that it was something like that. And so uh, when the doctor was saying all these things to us, we just, we stopped at brain cancer, incurable, and we just had this kind of deer in the headlights look on our faces, I guess. And he stopped talking. He goes, did your neurologist not tell you about this kind of stuff? And we're just shaking our head, no. And it was like we were hit with a truck and we were, I don't even remember, like I think I stopped breathing for a little Mm. while. And uh, so he left the room, Sean and I were just in there alone and we just were in shock. We were in shock, we couldn't couldn't even talk to each other. We were in such great shock. And so the rest of the doctors came in, that was when we knew it was really serious. I think there were three of them in there and uh, it was just a a gut punch and uh, disbelief, total Mm -hmm. disbelief. And I remember driving home and I just knew I had to make a lot of calls because we have a big family. And uh, definitely later, yeah, I cursed God. I still do sometimes. You know, that's the thing with grief and that's the thing with when you suffer a loss. It's not like a linear thing. You you can get back to those moments and, and I have those moments still, you know? And you know, that's one of the things I love about you. I don't know you. I'm just meeting you for the first time today. I've been on your Instagram and I've kind of followed you, but... You just said, I, I, I still do curse God. And, and it's not that you curse them. You, you, as, as parents, mm-hmm. our children get upset with us. Mm-hmm. They get mad at us because we make decisions or we have to be you know, authoritative or whatever it is. And that's a normal, valid father, heavenly father and daughter statement. You're well, it's upset. More, more questioning. Yeah, it's well, questioning, me, but it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a valid Absolutely. feeling. I mean, we, you know, I, I put my, my fists to the heavens, you know, and I yeah. say, well, Why? And uh, Sean and I had many conversations, and I remember the first ones involved, you know, why us? We we go to church. Yeah. We, you know, we try to be good people. Um, we help people. So we couldn't help but remember that he was a writer. I wore a microphone every day. And this is a disease that has no cure. And perhaps part of our purpose was to shine a light on this disease. Yeah. Um, talk about, maybe inspire someone to uh, seek a career in medicine and maybe be that person that will find the cure because there hasn't been even any real breakthroughs in treatment for this disease. And it's it can affect anyone, young, old, 
men and women. There's no, it's not hereditary. So we need to find a cure so that uh, no one has to, to lose their dad. There's so many different theories. Mm -hmm. And that's the difficult part about brain cancer. You can't, there's so few things that can break that uh, brain barrier. Um, so yeah, there's, you can't really research. And there have been people who have donated their brain um, after, but it gets very little funding. This disease gets hardly anything when it comes to funding from the federal government. And it goes to, you know, more, I hate to say it, more popular diseases. Um, but I think more and more people are dying from this. And I mean, they say 30,000 people are, are, you know, diagnosed with this and they, uh, per year or total? Per year. Wow. And it's glioblastoma. 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 And how is that yeah. different from a, a brain tumor that is well, this is a, operable? This was inoperable. It was really deep in there. It was really deep. Right. Yeah. They would not, no one would touch it because if anyone went in there, he would be dead. He would mm -hmm. be paralyzed. Oh, you, you know, it's way down near the um, thalamus, I guess, or your, your main vertebrae or I don't know what you call it. Mm -hmm. Spinal. Your hippothalamus. Thank you. I saw your the scans on on your yeah. interview, and it was pretty in there. Yeah. So um, it it it's not it's different from other cancers where some cancers it will metastasize and go to the brain. This is a cancer that originates in the brain, and so often when you see the symptoms of it, it's too late. It's often too mm -hmm. late, and um, there's uh, really there's been no real breakthroughs in 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 treatments, and certainly no cure. So you find out, and you you find out that you cannot oper operate, mm -hmm. and they tell you, I believe it was that you had about three months. Yeah, they said if we do nothing, uh, then you will probably have three months. If you do the standard care, standard treatment, maybe twelve months, maybe fourteen. And, and you ended uh, up getting eighteen. We got eighteen. You got so eighteen. We, and, and one of the things I bit of a gift. Yeah, this is such a gift. And I love that you you said you wanted to make every day count. Mm -hmm. and make memories um, and that um, you had the gift of a time. I'm, I'm looking at my notes because I wrote these things down. I just, you're so inspiring. You had uh, the gift of a timeline, which... Most people don't. I mean, we were sat down by that one particular doctor, Dr. Renna, and he was right. I mean, we were we were not happy with what he was saying because yeah. he was very plain spoken with us that day. And he told us about this disease. He had seen people with this disease and he did not mince words. He told us exactly what we would be expecting. And... Um, you know, he said, you, Maria, could walk down the street tomorrow and you could be hit by a bus. Yeah. We don't know, you know, but we know right now this timeline with Sean. So you go and you make each day count, make it like a month and each month like a year. And I remember walking out of that office and Sean and I both looked at each other and we're like, we should have, punched. he goes, I want to punch that guy in the uh. face, you know, <laughs> I mean, just all of that stuff. But but, but as always, and, and Sean was always a very positive person. If you think I'm positive, he, he was a very positive person. And, um, you know, he turned it around for us. And I always followed his lead. And he said, you know, he's right. And uh, I said, how are we going to do that? How do we, how do you actually live each day like a month? That seems so impossible. Yeah. But you know what? We got there. You did. We really did. We really did. And I love your story because you were married twice. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you said in your interview that um, you were fine, you were good, you were good on your own. And I think Carlos said, mm -hmm. and then I started walking by your office and I saw this big picture of <laughs> Sean on your desk. Yeah. And and you knew, you knew when you met him. Was it one of those instantaneous things when you met Sean that you, you knew? Or? You know, I knew he was someone special, that's for sure. I didn't know, I, I mean, I, I love at first sight. I mean, you know, definitely like at first sight. Yeah. And uh, I know when I met him that I, he was someone that was very special to me. And uh, I didn't need to get married again. I didn't really want to. I didn't want to have any more children. I was fine. I already had one. And I used to joke, you know, like, I, I don't, I didn't really have boyfriends. I just got married. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I think I met my first husband. We were. Uh, she's my soul sister. Yeah. <laughs> right? You're talking to a mirror. I mean, yeah. yes, we are. Yeah. So my first, we were like childhood sweethearts. My, my, my older son's father, we lived and grew up next to each other mm. down the street. And so we got married. Um, and then the second was, I was in college and then I was like, yes. <laughs> and so by the time I met Sean, I was good. Yeah. I was feeling myself. I was in my thir early thirties and I thought, you know, I'm good at my career. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't need a man necessarily. And so when I met him, it was very special. And I, 
he was my happily ever after. We were both each other's. How did you meet, if you don't mind me asking? We met um, at a dinner party that my colleague at the time was throwing with her then boyfriend, who became her husband, um, which was Sean's younger brother. Yeah, his name is Patrick. And uh, they told, or she told me that it was a dinner party uh, that I should go to. And I said, well, you know, these are all couples. It's you guys and your friends that are couples. And she goes, no, you should really go. We you got you really go. go. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> and, uh, it was a setup? It was, it was a setup. But here's the thing. I did not want to go by myself. We did not want to be a third wheel because I knew there were several couple, couples that were going. And so my other colleague, uh, John, before Carlos got there, there was a John. And uh, John walks into the makeup room, I remember. And uh, Lauren says, John, what are you doing tomorrow night? He goes, what are we doing? What are we doing? So we both, so he was sort of my date. He was my date. We went up to that dinner. And uh, I remember when Sean walked in along with his brothers. It was the end of the night. It was the end of the dinner. It was funny because um, there were pictures being taken. So it was me and John. And I was actually getting ready to leave. But then they walk in. And so I stayed for for a while longer. So Sean came and introduced himself to me right away. And then I think he was tipped off that there was somebody there that you should meet. And... uh, they took a picture of everyone in the party and then it was me, John, and Sean. And uh <laughs> you pushed John away. No, 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 no. Oh, Here's a funny story. Awesome. Uh, the night before we got married, uh Patrick had gifted us it was a surprise and it was a giant uh, picture of he goes, Who has a picture of the moment that you make that oh. you meet? Oh true, yeah, right. So it was that very, we, we literally had just met. Wow. And um, someone had taken a photo. And so it, it, they had such a hard time cutting John out <laughs> to get me and Sean. So I, right. yeah, so I still have that uh, that big framed photo of, of literally the moment that we met that wow, night. Wow, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, I have so many so many questions in my <laughs> mind right now. I, I know you've been, you're a, a meteorolo- meteorologist. Mm-hmm. I'm Can't the morning. That word. On the morning show. <laughs> morning meteorologist. And, yeah. and I look at you, and you've been in movies, uh, Bruce Almighty, Cold Case, Criminal Minds. You've worked with Clint Eastwood's uh, Blood. Blood work. Blood work, yeah. Yes. So you've done a lot of on-camera. I've uh, been here a long time. You've been here. It's yeah. hard to believe. 20, literally, literally, like, I've it's so a, hard to believe. You yeah, look so young. Fox for, tw- it'll be 21 years in March, and May, in May. Mm-hmm. 21 years I know that is a long time so you guys you and Sean shared this you you kind of you met and you knew you you shared the the industry together too you had a a familiar Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes did he ever watch you and and did he know uh yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) what did he what did he remember when he saw you oh well when we first met I remember he came he that did like a beeline straight to me and he goes oh you're Maria like introduced himself to me and he goes you were wearing this like scarf boa or something the other night so he was i mean he he did he get did the tip homework. yeah he, he did his homework okay, yeah okay that's cute i love it yeah. well um back to your book because i do have a lot of questions about that um there's I, i'm flipping the page here um the first chapter is basically uh it, the book's called you can't do it alone a, w- a widow's journey through Lo- lost grief and life after um and the first chapter is what gripped me the most because i have a child and literally, it's so raw and good and candid. And I've never read anything so real before that took me literally through down the hallway to, you know, the room um, when you talk about your son and, and you t- telling him that, that his dad getting... passed away mm-hmm. last mm-hmm. night. And his first reaction was, no, why didn't you mm-hmm. tell me? Why didn't you wake me up? Why, why didn't did... you wake me up? And I mean, that's just a double punch for you I'm sure and you had your very good reasons and and so tell me about that moment I know it's difficult to talk about but tell me about that moment um because as a mother myself I can't can't imagine yeah you know we had started going to therapy um I talk about this in the book and how right away after the diagnosis we sought a counselor just for me and Sean to help us understand the diagnosis and how to speak to each other. I, I'm a f- huge believer in therapy, regardless. I think we should all go to therapy. Uh, <laughs> the moment we're born, I mean, we go, we go, you know, yeah, we go to get well baby checkups every year for physical. We should do a mental one too, at least once or twice a year. And um, without our therapist, Betsy, I, I, I would not have had the language, the words to 
mm -hmm. um, help Gus understand what was going on from the beginning, including the diagnosis and the disease and what it was, and then all the way to, by the time he had just turned five years old, to talk to him about how daddy um, died. And so the therapist and I talked about, well, what if he dies in the middle of the night? What if, you know, this, this, and that? So I just remember her telling me, Maria, do whatever your gut tells you, because it will never be wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that Sean passed it, you know, in the middle of the night. It was like two something. And so I did think, should I wake Gus up? And I decided not to. How old was Gus at the time? He had just turned five. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he was asleep in, in, in the room. And I had made the decision not to. And by the time, you know, he woke up, which was later than usual, which surprised me, uh, I decided to tell him. Now, he was upset with me for not doing that. And, and I apologized to him. And I said I was sorry. And uh, we went to therapy. And I remember he expressed some of that anger. But he has forgiven me. And ah. so, yeah. So, you know, we can teach our kids um, not just the language of, of disease and cancer and death, but also forgiveness. I mean, there's so much to learn still for me. Mm. Um, in fact, I think she's talking to Gus right now as we speak. Oh, it's such a beautiful moment that I get to be here with you. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I just have to say that when you talk about the book and when people tell me they've read the book and how it's helped them, I have to say that my heart, which has been broken in a million pieces, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. every time I hear that, it heals my heart. It does. And that's one of the other reasons I wrote the book. And, and, and I want to talk about it. And I want it to be successful. Obviously, I want people to get something from it. But I get something from it, too. And, and it heals my heart. And I thank you. I thank you for helping me do that. Wow. You are, are truly a gift because, honestly, I say this all the time, and Bob is used to me saying this, you know, we go through pain as, as human beings, and if you can turn your pain into your purpose, which you truly have, um, it's worth it. And, and like you said, and we've had many guests on the show, and they'll say, if, if, even if it's just one person, and I resonated on many for many reasons in this book, and I've been married twice and divorced twice, and uh, which both times I did, it wasn't my choice. And so it was, they say that, you know, divorce is, divorce is like kind of like a death. It is like a death. And especially when it's severed for no reason. In, and so I identified in, in this, in many ways in this book. And it helped me. Good. It good. did. Yeah. And your descriptions are incredible of, of how you've walked through this. And you have um, many different chapters of, of, of which I wanted. I wrote them down. I know I'm lame. I'm super lame. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I, not. I'm not. We call that prepared. You're very well, prepared. <laughs> prepared. But this is like a, this whole show for me is a different. I'm sitting on this side now. I'm used to sitting on that side. And so I, I want to make sure and Bob knows us that I can adequately convey your story oh, in a you. way that deserves it. And so um, you have different chapters. You have um, uh, chapter one is you can't do it alone. And that talks about how you really can't do it alone. And, and it's whether whether your your husband has died or he has left or something, there are many, you know, stages and, and reasons for grief. Mm -hmm. This doesn't, this this can apply to anyone. Well, that's the, that's the thing that everyone's been telling me, especially now during the pandemic. We feel this sort of, um, we're powerless, you know, with, with what's happening and, yes. and, and this virus. And it's such a parallel to what, what I have gone through with, with uh, Sean and the cancer and the death and the disease. And so I've actually heard this phrase said so many times, you can't do this alone. And we're all alone. And I, my heart goes out to the people who have suffered a loss during this year or very recently. Mm -hmm. And um, I know it's affected me and impacted my life um, in a way that I never expected this past year. We're all having to quarantine. We're and isolated. So, yes. And yeah. so I just want to remind everybody, like the title of the book is You Can't Do This Alone. And we have to reach out and thank God for technology because we're able to do that um, a lot more easy, easily than, than, than we have before. Yeah. Well, the second chapter is, um, it's finding joy. And when I read that chapter, I was thinking, you know, you knew, you know, it's easy to find joy in everyday life, but you're finding joy in a moment where you have this, you know, looming, uh, 
Tragic. definitive end to, to this, right? Yeah. And so um, you built memories. And tell me what, like, your, did you guys have a bucket list? And yeah. did you sit down and say, hey, we want to make these things happen in the next sort of, several months? Yeah. First of all, I want to say that even though we had this diagnosis, we never gave up hope. No. And you cannot ever give up hope. If you are facing something like this, a debilitating disease or, or, or a, a terminal uh, <laughs> diagnosis, there's always hope. There are always people mm -hmm. who have gone beyond the expected timeline. So we never gave up hope on that. And so mm -hmm. that's one thing that you must remember. Yes. Uh, because that's what helps keep us going. And so we always lived each day, not with the death in mind, right. but with the hope that this was going to continue. So I encourage you all to do that no, no matter what. And you changed diets and you got, yes. you did the whole thing. I know yes. it's all in this book. I mean, there's so much information in here and you, you talk about, um, the, that cancer cannot live in, uh, sugar, a, in like sugar. You, you sh cancer loves sugar. Yes. And I remember how Sean, he was he had a bad sugar tooth. I mean he so ate I. a lot of chocolate. Not that you're gonna get cancer, no, that's what I'm saying. No. But when you like if for him, he he faced this disease. So we changed our diet and uh, we went with the ketogenic diet and, and I really believe that that's what helped Yes, extend him. his life. Yes, yes I agree. So we cut all the carbs and the sugar and we you know, try to be creative with some of the meals. And of course I, you know, we all ate it as a family and so that made it, you know, better. Yeah, we changed our lifestyle and um, we just, we remembered each day and like what we did that day. And if you really think hard and you go to bed each night and you think about what you did that day and what you were grateful for, you can come up with a lot. And uh, that's what we forget, you know, in our busy lives that uh, there's a lot to be grateful and thankful for. And, and we were reminded of that each day for sure. And uh, my mind is thrilling. I'm just, this is, this is, um, it hits close to home. I know. I it know. does. Yeah. And like you said, you know, so many people are suffering right now and they're isolated and they're broken and they're lost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the main title I think is, is perfect because it's not, it, you can't do things in general alone. You can't, you can't walk through a really difficult time as I've gone through myself and, you're in the fetal position and you're, mm -hmm. and, and part of us has like this pride where no, yes. I'll just handle it right on my mm -hmm. own and I'll, I can do this. Especially and, as women. Especially you know, as women. We and you've got have to prove it, you know, you've yeah. got a child that you need to stay strong for too. Yeah. And inside you're literally broken and you're, but you're, you're trying to hold it all together. How did, uh, you're pretty honest in this book. I mean, well, you're very, I'm, you are yes. transparent in well, this Well, you know, book. this book, part, when, when Sean was first diagnosed, I, we Google, right? We just, we yeah. research for all the information that you want. And I had a difficult time finding real uh, succinct uh, pieces of, of uh, I saw blogs for sure. I saw blogs at that time and, but not in a book. And so... Were there varying stories where one would say one thing, one would say the opposite? Yeah, and, and that's typical for um, a cancer like brain cancer because the deficits that come on are, are so different and varied depending on where the tumors are and what part of their brain it really affects. So that's a whole part of it as well. But this is the book that I wish I had yeah. in yes. the beginning. Yes, Because it does talk about what you can do, how you can look for um, not just hope, obviously, and help, but, but some treatments and uh, what to spend your energy on versus what not to. And so it's a, it's a quick read and, and it is an honest, because I can't be anything else. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm definitely I just I'm an honest person and to, to a fault. And so that this book is really about my my experience truly in our, in our family. It is about your experience, but it's also, it's a great resource. You have a lot of great resources in here. I mean, you, you went to UCLA and you found a, a, a brain the young the neuro oncologist a group yeah, to talk team. to and you had oh, yes, and, yes, and, yes. and there were like these and God uses the, the samurai. Number seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there, seven, there seven. were like seven people in your group that yeah. that you really identified with and you, you clung on to really in those moments and you shared your stories and 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 you called them the samurai. Yeah. In fact we just had a Zoom this past weekend. You did? Um, yes. We tried to still get together. I mean obviously we can't physically get together now, but last year, um well, just in general, we try to get to that every two, three months, and we just catch up and we talk and and uh, share, yeah, share life experiences. They were so valuable to me in the beginning because we met in this support group, 
specifically for brain cancer caregivers. This is how debilitating this disease is. There is an actual support group just, just for, for that. the caregivers. Yes. There's no other cancer really that's out there that has that. I, I've not seen it. And uh, I met them probably about the third month in. My only regret is was not meeting them sooner. Mm -hmm. And so I have talked to the oncology team since we've tried to help and you know devise ways of making it easier for, for not just patients but for, for caregivers. And I've said, you know, when a new patient comes in, you should really write a prescription for the spouse or the parents or whomever is doing the caregiving. Yeah. And you must make them go to this support group because they didn't do that really with me. I saw the flyers. And uh, eventually I got it. Like God yeah. was telling me yeah. something, you know. Yeah. I remember sitting next to that flyer and I'm like, okay, I guess I got to call these people. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to that meeting that first time and we just, I just connected with all of them. And systematically each one of them lost their spouses. Like Linda lost her spouse in January and the next one was like March. Mm. So it was, the timeline was uncanny with me losing Sean in December. And so they were literally lampposts for me on this very dark uh, road and journey. And they helped me, um, you know, recognize some of the symptoms, helped me make decisions that were very difficult, like calling hospice or, um, you know, doing these, these different things. And, and so without them, I know that that road would have been even more terrifying. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thank each of them every day uh, and for that. The resources are out there, and sometimes we get so bogged down with just day to day and keeping your child's life, you know, steady and consistent and we don't take care of ourselves, but I love that you did and, and you went for it. I tried. You yeah. did. Yeah. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> yeah, my, now my nose is ready. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I, my, I, I'm going and it's because I'm really feeling your, you. Um, I know. I know. I feel like you're my soul sister. I just met you and I, 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 I feel love that, that way too. We're like the same age. It's amazing. I, I know. Well, <laughs> I look older than her. No, you do not. Stop yeah. it. You I don't. love you. I really love you. I, and, and, yeah. and, you know, I'm really big and I constantly say this to, to turn your pain into your purpose. Otherwise, it doesn't feel worth it. And you don't, it's not that it has to feel worth it. But, but that's, uh, that's a way to heal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very healing. It's a way to heal. And, and I think for some people that are still in the pain, um, you know, maybe they haven't yet found that purpose. And, and so for me, yes, the pain is there, but it helps. It, it does helps. help. It helps make it feel better. And so we're kind of on, I'm going through the chapters here. Uh, chapter three is Reality Bites. Tell me a little bit about what's in chapter three. I know I read it, but it... it it does bite sometimes, right? And you said earlier, I'm, I, I throw my fists up to God mm -hmm. sometimes. I do too, even now. Yeah, even and that's now. what makes yeah. us real, right? Yes. And I know I've been in, in, the, in my kitchen on the, my floor crying, saying, God, if you don't want me to have this desire, then take the desire away from me or whatever it is. Tell me about, you know, the, in that moment of the reality bites chapter, how you were feeling and... Um. I, I think that was, uh, I know, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what the reality bites uh, referred to, but I think it just meant that the reality of, of what was happening mm -hmm. was setting in and the deficits were coming in. Mm -hmm. And I think I was realizing what we were facing as a, as a family. And it's balancing that with the hope can be hard mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there were many moments where, yes, a lot of cursing. Why? And inevitably, I would go to Sean. And part of, I think, what gave me strength and still gives me strength today was how he handled it. Hmm. And uh, he was, Sean was more religious than I was, that's for sure. When we first met, he uh, went to church every Sunday. He went to Mass. He was a much better Catholic. Didn't and, he say, uh, um, and I love this, he said, um, we don't have time. To be angry. Yeah. We don't have time to be angry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. And none of us do, by the way. Like you said, yeah. we could walk out and get hit by a car, mm -hmm. any of us. And so we really should take a look at just that one sentence. We don't have time to be angry. There's no time. Right? Yeah. I mean, we took a little moment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you have to let that in too. You have to yeah. grasp what's happening. And then, you know, let's go. Let's Let's fight this. Yeah. Let's do this. And uh, so he, he, he really led the way for me. And, and people would always say, Maria, you're so strong. You know, you, hard, I don't know how you're doing this. 
And I just look at him and I, I don't know how he's doing it. He's the one that has to suffer through the treatments, the medicine, mm -hmm. the nausea, the hair loss. The, he went through radiation twice a day. Hmm. He got the, the treatment uh, plan and the schedule was so harrowing. And yet he went through it. So I look at him and I think, if he can do it, I can do this. I can do this. Yeah. And whenever we would go get treatments and we would see a, a young child, I mean, that was hard for us. And we knew how lucky we were to at least have had this time. And when we saw that eight-year-old, that 10-year-old, um, you know, that put it into perspective for us. And we were very grateful for the gift that we had. Mm. So, um, yeah, that kept us going. And for Gus, he was... He was three, three when he first mm -hmm. found out. And yeah. did you tell him immediately yep. at three? Pretty much, because mm -hmm. kids are very smart. You mm -hmm. know that. I know. And we, you know, as parents, we try to shield them and protect them, but we're really doing them a disservice if we try to just gloss over it and pretend like nothing's happening. They pick up on everything. They sure yeah. do. The joke was, you yeah. know, it's almost like they're human. They catch everything. <laughs> yeah. They, they yeah. see when you're upset. Yes. And they, because all they do is they watch you all day long and they yes. you can't put anything over them, especially when they're three or five. Yeah. Because they're well, just you constantly watching. If they're old enough um, to ask what's wrong, they're old enough to know the answer. Exactly. Right. They're, if they're old enough to know to ask, then you have to you owe it to them to give them an answer. Now you have to tell them in their age level, you know, and so he was three and, and again I refer back to our therapist and we were very plain spoken with him and said you know what, we just went to the doctor's office and daddy's been diagnosed with a disease. And he'll say, what disease? You know, it's called cancer. And uh, it's important for you to know that daddy has it, but you don't have it. Right. Mommy doesn't have it. No one else has it. Just mm -hmm. daddy. And then he, you know, kids, uh, are they going to fix him? Yes, mm -hmm. the doctors are working hard to fix him. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get these medicines and... And so, you know, we just start there and we don't give them too much information, but we're just, we're very honest because they know you walk in that door and you're devastated, you're going to confuse them. They're going to be scared. Yes. And that's the last thing we want um, our children to be. And I remember because in the book, it says that it's, it's interesting how you are prepared in your life for the future in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was seven, my birth father died in an accident. Mm. And so... You know, as a young kid, I remember that, and I remember how scared I was. And Sean and I, you know, of course, Sean knew my history, and he knew that I had lost my birth dad. And the last thing we wanted to do was was for Gus to be scared, afraid of losing me or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we really kept him in the loop, and we told him exactly what was happening. And when it was close to talking about death, we did. We talked about that. We talked about what it means to die and uh, how your heart stops and you stop breathing. So it's very clinical. Yes. But they understand it. They don't understand. Like if you said daddy's sick, we never use that word sick. Mm. Because then they think in their mind, if, if they get sick, they're going to die too. That's such great I, advice. Like right there alone, knowing the words to say in these moments is so important. It is important. Well, yeah. Had Sean experienced death before with a pet or a relative or anything else? Had he understood what death meant? Um, you mean uh, Gus? Gus? I, I yeah. Gus, yeah, yeah, yes. Gus. You know what? Um, again, it's weird how life works. My parents came to, to stay with us during that time. They were such an integral part, as as our whole family. Mm -hmm. Sean's brothers, their wives, our, our in-laws, our friends. And so my parents came, and their dog, uh, Nikolai, whom they've had forever. And, like, Nikolai actually passed away mm. January of that year. Mm or early in that year, if I remember correctly. And so he, we had to talk to him about what death was with with the dog. Wow. And so he kind of understood, you know, yeah. um, what, what it was death was. like a little, a little bit not of a, a gift, but a gift. But I mean, it it's was. sad, but it's also yeah. kind of prepared him. Yeah. And yeah. frankly, all of us, you know, because we suffered a loss and it kind mm -hmm. of like, yeah, so... It's they really do take your cue, and, and I won't go into my whole story, but I have a similar. My ex-husband had flatlined when my daughter was 15, and he was on a business trip, and and I remember he was in a coma for um, yeah. two weeks, and we weren't sure if he was going to live or die. There was a 10% chance, and I had just had a giant tumor taken from my stomach. And, oh, my and gosh. And to your point, um, 
children take our cue. I remember it all happening so fast and you feel like this big giant gavel hits you, right? Mm -hmm. And it's taking your breath away. But I remember saying to Ariana, my daughter, don't worry, I'm we're, I'm going to see to it that you get through this and you have um, a normal high school experience. And that was really what just the only thing that came to mind. And I saw the weight come off because she was a child. Yeah. She was young, right? She, kids just want to know if that their world gonna isn't okay. going to fall apart, yeah. Yeah. right? They're going to be okay. And they do take your cues. And so it, they, they animals do too. They, they feel that energy, that mm-hmm. scent, you know? And so I love how you handled it with your son. I'm really envious and um, in awe of how you handled it and still handle it. I think you're an amazing right. mom. Well, it sounds like you did all the right things, too. I no, think instinctually. I didn't do all the right you know? things, but it's instinctual, yeah. right? And we our first thing is to guard our children's hearts. We want to protect hearts, our children, yeah. Right? Right. But, but sometimes we go too far when we try to hide those things. And so I think... Um, Again, I'm a big proponent for therapy. The thing about the book is after each chapter, um, I I partnered with uh, our contributing writer, Lauren Schneider, who is a professional licensed Mm -hmm. family therapist. And uh, she does break each chapter down. and She's able to universally um, expand it so that it's not just specifically for brain cancer, but it's she really does take the lessons we learned and then and then widens it out so that everyone can get something from it. Mm-hmm. And those, that doesn't mean you didn't have those moments. I mean, I remember you saying the moment that you told your son and he went to his dad's room that night, mm-hmm. you jumped in bed with him and you guys just held each other and cried, you and Gus. Yeah. And you have those real moments, right, that yeah. you can share with your Yeah, your it's, son. it's interesting how children grieve. Children grieve differently. They're, they're like... They don't know. Mm-hmm. We have a hard time mm-hmm. recognizing it ourselves, yeah. how much for a child. And so some days, I mean, particularly during those first few years, um, Gus would act a little, you know, not himself. And um, I would just recognize it and go, you know what, Gus? I miss Daddy, too. Mm-hmm. And then there would be like a, a change in him because I'm identifying what he's probably feeling. And, mm-hmm. I, I, and I remember like going... I'm missing him. He must be too. So I'm hoping that I'm helping him identify his feelings. And, you know, my wish is that he grows up to be a well-adjusted kid who is in, in tune with his feelings and, 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 and he knows, you know, how to recognize mm-hmm. uh, these things. Yeah. Well, I think you're doing a great job. And that takes me to chapter four, Taking Charge. That's the title of chapter four in, in your book. And that you really have done that. You've taken charge. And just give us a little bit about that chapter. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to give it all away. And even if even though we're telling your story here, mm-hmm. there is so much in this book that, I mean, every sentence, sometimes, you know, when you're reading and it's like two paragraphs gets you to the point. I mean, every sentence is a golden nugget uh-huh. in this book. Really, it is. Um, yes. Taking charge. Yeah. Sorry. Taking charge. Yeah. Uh, you know... You, as the caregiver, or even the person that's maybe going through therapy or cancer or disease, you do have to take charge of of the situation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, nothing's going to get done. But for me, there were ways to take charge. And and one of them is, um, you know, the way we communicated with people. Mm -hmm. I think so many people want to help, right? Don't deprive them of helping you. I mean, you can't do it alone. You really can't do it alone. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And so uh, I would send out an email at least once a month, and I would itemize what was going on. I would give everybody an update on Sean's condition, and I would basically say, here's what I need, or here's what, you know, or people would just see that there's a lack of something, mm-hmm. and they would just come. And, um, you know, even to, like, play with Gus for one hour, mm-hmm was so valuable to us. Mm-hmm. And uh, they would just, like, a, you know, an uncle or a cousin would come over and they'd be just like, can you guys play? And uh, that really helped yeah. all of us. Um, you know, th- books to read. Like, I remember so many research books that were given to me or, or sent to me. And w- my sister's-in-law would just say, And you have a I'll lot of those that. in here. You put a yeah. lot of those in there. That's what I loved is that you gave, you gave uh, your readers Mm -hmm. valuable information i mean sometimes when you're in those moments like myself everybody's different yes but i i don't i don't want i just retreat 
I kind of become a recluse and I go through the pain alone, and that's not healthy. People yeah. want to help you. I mean, yeah. you had a you had a nice family there that that wanted to be there for you, so it's nice that you. Well, it's also the other people are going through it, not yes. to anywhere the degree yes. you are, but they're, they're going to suffer loss too, so they absolutely. need to be involved, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so it helped them, you know, try to fit where they could fit mm -hmm. and uh, be a help, really, than than be a hindrance. And yeah, I'm just so fortunate that we have the family and circle of friends that I had and, and even my work family. Mm -hmm. I mean, my work family, were, they were just amazing. And uh, my viewers, you know, yes. they, they uh, provided me with support too. Yeah. And, and so all of that, it, it all matters. Yeah. And chapter five, memories never die. I'm just going to say a little bit about that. You, you got a chance to, to um, videotape a lot of the, la the last 18 months of Sean's life, and they're, I saw a little bit of them, and they're beautiful. It really is beautiful. Yeah, videotape as much as you can, guys, because <laughs> right. you never know. I mean, even, I tell you, I always get the biggest hard drives. <laughs> I can save everything, um, and I still feel like I didn't get enough, but we did. We we really did. I remember taping um, Sean when he was shaving, and I said, oh, this, we need to get this so that Gus will never wonder, you know, he'll, he'll get that first lesson from him on, on shaving or... Did he make tapes for his son? You know what? He he didn't, mm -hmm. not really, because, you know, when you're diagnosed with, with brain cancer, like I said, like often it's too late by then. So he had already started the fine line for someone going through cancer. I think and for Sean, it was very, very so to leave those tapes, to say <coughs> things when you're gone for him meant he was giving into the disease. So that was him, and I respected that. I understand that. Totally. Yeah. Like, yeah. he was given the opportunity to have a port, you know, those mm -hmm. ports where you can mm -hmm. um, get your uh, transfusions automatically and blood draws and things, and he refused to do that mm -hmm. because for him, he felt that that was giving into the disease. Mm -hmm. And so I respected that. Now, he got more pokes than anybody I ever. No. You know, the fl phlebotomist would come and, and, and poke him so many times, but he, that was his thing. And so um, we respected that. He did finally write a little book for Gus. He, he wrote um, a thing called Gus's Guide, which I've, I've turned into a little book. And oh, I've even given his cousins, or, you know, his uncle's copies, and so they have that. But they're direct from his dad. And so there's enough in there that, that's keeping him going. In fact, he just read a chapter. I think we did it last week, maybe. It was on girls. <laughs> oh, man. Gus. Gus, is now... Gus and girls. He's 10. Okay. So, you know, fourth grade. He's adorable, by he's the way. To thank yeah. you. But I don't know if you remember fourth grade. Yes. I think I started getting like a little crush on Yes. Him. So, um, I, you know, we asked him about girlfriends. And he, it was the first time where he didn't really shy away from it. He was just kind of like, well, you know, daddy said to wait until after high school. So I'm waiting. I <laughs> so love he said, that. I wish I would have taped that, actually. That's yeah. actually really sweet that he's yeah. referring to what, what oh, yeah. his daddy said right there. That's yeah. wonderful. He broke it down in ages like birth to three, three to five, five to seven. And so That's we great. would just refer to it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just... Again, blown away that your book uh, can't do it alone. A widow's journey through la loss, grief, and life after. Um, hey Bob. Yes. You're speechless. Yeah, <laughs> I am because I mean, there's so many things. I know people listening. You know, everybody has some kind of pain that they've gone through. You know, yeah. and there are a lot of books out there. But honestly, I'm telling you, you guys, even if you got this. Um, and you aren't going through anything, and you haven't gone through anything, but you have this book. It it helps in many ways in your life. It's not. It's it's. I don't want to say that it's not just for people that have have lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. It's for. It's in life in general. Oh, thank don't you. Don't go through pain alone. Thank you. Right. I do. I do think it's got um, good nuggets in there because mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, we all are going to go through this. We're going to die. Yes. I mean, that's just. There's two sure things. <laughs> yeah. That's what do Death they say? Taxes. Death, Death and taxes. taxes. Yeah. Yes. That those are two certainties, uh, for sure, for all of us. And so I hope that this book can offer some comfort mm -hmm. for people who have gone through not just what we've gone through, but also the pandemic and what's been going on, mm -hmm. but also for you for other people. Because often 
you know, when we meet someone that has just suffered a loss and we don't know what to say, you know, I, I'm certainly guilty of that very awkward things to say. And, and so hopefully this book can help you maybe say things like maybe nothing, <laughs> like saying nothing is okay too. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just see someone and, and just say, I'm pissed for you, you know, and that's, and, and that's okay. Um, so yeah, I hope this book can offer you some insight on what to say or do or not say or not yeah. do around someone who um, has just suffered a loss. Before this interview ends, I'm going to read the pre preface. Preface. I'm dyslexic. The preface. The preface. Yes, I'm going to read it, or you can read it. But um, no, no, you read it. I, it's, I, it. It really. It gets you right. It's interesting because when I um, <laughs> there she's back. Bob's our little, dog. Our little doggy. You know she wants back. to be in here with us. She's cute. She, she was like she was Maria. Yeah. <laughs> That Maria has that sweet. You know, she probably angelic. smells our doggy because we do have a dog. You do. Uh, uh, I her name's went Sunny. to a friend's house and they have a new puppy and it jumped all over me and I got back and Tanks was just like, "Who yeah. you been with?" It was like, yeah. like I cheated on her. <laughs> and I put my shoes down. And she spent like twenty minutes sniffing my shoes and looking at me. Oh well. boy, I know Sunny's gonna do that when I get home. Mm -hmm. Uh, the preface, oh, so you were saying about the preface. So when I went to the publisher to write this book, this book, by the way, took, um, I think it took me almost three years from beginning to end to mm. write. It was very cathartic for me. It was painful, definitely, yeah. uh, to go back to those moments. But I remembered them so vividly. So I wrote as I thought. So I think I'm, I'm glad it resonated with you because I did write it as if, uh, you were there with me. That's the only way I can do. I'm not a writer. Yes, yes you are. Huh? <laughs> no, it, you are. Sean was the writer, so I would often sit at my computer and I would say, "Honey, you need to write this. You're the writer. You were supposed to write this book." He told you and, though. Uh, he, he told you, and it says it in this book, he, he told you that there, you know, there is a writer in you, <laughs> right? Well, he's, he was a writer uh, yes. by profession, and I speak for a living. I don't even read a teleprompter. I don't write anything. You know, as meteorologists, we just we kind of just speak from the from the head and ex extemporaneously. We just know the the information. Sometimes we get it wrong, but we're, <laughs> we're okay. Uh, but so Sean was the writer. He was the one that constantly wrote, and so I would always come to him with ideas. I'd be like, honey, you got to write this um, this thing on the news today, which you know you can't. Real life is so much more yes. dramatic than what they write in Hollywood. It's yes. crazy. So I would give him ideas all the time, and he'd go, that's such a great story idea. He goes, <laughs> no, you go write it. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so uh, he would wow. always say, you're a writer. Go write it. And I never did write anything. And so here I am writing this book. I, was, I, was, I didn't want it to be this for my first book, but here it is. And I know mm. he, was, he was a big part of, of, of writing that one. Of God's me. plan, right? Yeah. You said if you can help one person... And I, I'm just saying, <laughs> you've helped me in the last oh. 24 hours, you know, and, and I'm being honest. I, I hadn't, I thought the interview was yesterday. We were already, <laughs> I was excited to meet you and I hadn't had a chance to read it. I read all about you and I'd watched interviews and, and, and I knew, I said to Bob, I, I have to read this story. I hope she doesn't come in so I can read this book. No, but he I did tell me that when we first walked in here that you had read the book. I was amazed um, that, that you, you did it so quickly. It is a quick read, for sure. And it's interesting you say that it helps you because when I did the audio book, um, the, the engineer, there were two engineers. Of course, we were distance. They were in a different room. And I would say, and uh, he said, you know, Maria, after it was all over, and I was so moved and touched by what he said. And he goes, I'm not just saying this, but your book really helped me. And I said, well, how? Like, how? You know, he goes, well, I didn't tell you before, but my wife has been, um, she's been in a wheelchair. She, mm -hmm. she had, I think she had Luke, I don't know if she had Luke Eriks or something. And he goes, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask for help. I have been her, her caregiver 24 seven. And he goes, I never make time for myself because I don't want to leave her. Mm -hmm. I feel guilty. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to do it because it's good for me. It's good for her. And, uh. Thank you for for reminding me, and it's not just it's not pride. It's it's really, mm -hmm. you know, our, our our healing and our self care. So yeah. I, that that really moved my me. My aunt did the same bad. thing. My aunt's um, now her wife, but was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's years ago, yeah. and she spent the first seven years taking care of her to a yeah. point where she said, "I can't anymore. It's, I definitely need the help." Yeah, so. and, and and people want to help. They they're mm -hmm. willing to. And they want to. They want to help, but as and, and my best friend's husband fell years ago three years ago and became a quadriplegic. I could, we oh talked gosh. about this, her and I, and I can talk about this on the air. And, and being a caregiver is a heavy position. It is. And it is very difficult to pull away from it. And it's very difficult to, you know, make it about you at all. But every single solitary person, including myself, has told her, and she's amazing, you know, you have to 
to take care of yourself. You can't burn out. There's something called caregiver burnout. Mm-hmm. And there's there are, you know, mm-hmm. places to go yeah. and talk to others about this mm-hmm. and you can't. So it manifests and it does in different ways. And I know for me, even this past year of the pandemic, um, and again I'm like so honest to a fault, but the 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 year, last year for me, um, manifested in I just found out in January that I have these ulcers in my stomach. Mm. <laughs> and so oh. I think part of it was the stress of being so isolated Mm. and I was working from home and you know this the technical things that go wrong on a daily basis when you do a live show so you do the weather from home I did yes I did for for really from March of last year till October it was very stressful yes and you know that coupled with grief and loss and missing Mm -hmm. Sean more than ever Mm -hmm. because because now you're isolated now now we're yes so now we're just like me and my son my parents couldn't come and it was right so for those of you listening I mean I I feel you right now like I Mm -hmm. get it and so we have to reach out and 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 because it manifests in different ways and for me it was ulcers Mm -hmm. and so I'm getting it taken care of or you know trying to get medicine and everything but um hopefully I'll be back to 100 percent and sorry uh, yeah no thank you you are going to be 100 (laughs) percent I will be 100 percent but you're right it does I I, we talked a little bit about this before but disease is dis-ease right and and it can has to go somewhere goes it has to go somewhere. Good for me. <laughs> right, right. Um, we're going to re- read the preface, but I, I want to end on that. Okay. Um, we do have a couple little things that we do, um, three things that we do, Bob. No, I was saying three words. <laughs> oh, no, yes. We, we, do, the, we, we do three things um, with each guest. And so I'm going to ask you couple questions and we're going to do the Rorschach test. It's the ink blot test. Oh, what yeah, it's we kind see? of fun. We've, we've um, done it with everybody. We've so done it with far, everybody and it's been really fun. It's okay. really interesting to see who sees what. what okay. Because <laughs> yeah. they're always the same photos yeah. or the same ink blots. Yes. Okay. Um, I usually ask my guests um, what three words best describe yourself, but I actually would like you to, to tell our listeners what three words best describes Sean. Oh. Your husband. Sean. Okay. It's hard to narrow down to three. I knew you were uh, going to say that. I wish I had said that because I knew. I just had this feeling, you, you know, you have so much for him. So he's He was such a big personality. So what's, okay, three words. Uh, loud. <laughs> he's, he was so loud. And I, I can still hear him today. Aww. I mean, he's that loud. Um, he was funny. Love it. And uh, he was just, oh gosh, it's one more word. Um, he seems to me like charismatic. He had like he this was, big smile. He had a huge smile, right? He had a beautiful was, smile, yes. He had a big mouth, so I, he was really loud. Um, you know, he was just, he was so loving. Hmm. And he, I'm going to miss that, I think, the most um, in terms of just the kind of care and, and love that he showered on me and Gus. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, he was That's very uh, very caring. And uh, he was very romantic, too. So. Oh, I love <laughs> so that. That's a fourth word. I'm oh. sorry. No, that's wonderful. No, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you these little ink blot tests. It's <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, don't let them scare you. I didn't pick the pictures. Bob did. Okay. Just that's my you don't disclaimer. Have to <laughs> Standard Rorschach test pictures. Just whatever you see as fast as you can. So I need like to put my glasses on for this. No, no they're no? pretty okay. bold. They're, they're, bold they're pretty loud, it. actually. Right? Okay. So like number one. So what do I see here? Oh, I see Dr. Seuss looking in the mirror. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Yes? Do you see him? Well, I, I see There's that. no right or wrong answer, but there's I do no see right that. There's no right or wrong, but like, yeah. that's the interesting th- thing about yeah. this is that each person sees something different, and I'm, yeah. I can see through it. Yeah. And so I actually kind of, I get I what you're saying Dr. Seuss. That's yeah. the mom in me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Oh, oh, wow. Okay. I see a frog and a uterus. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first yeah. person who said that. No. <laughs> really? Have no. you, you know what? I see like a like the, the pelvis bone or something. Do you I know what's like, what's crazy is right now I'm looking at it and I see elephants right here. That's what I always saw. You did? Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. looking at it from behind though. You can see. Oh. You see little elephants in their snouts. But that's yeah. the thing about the test is like everybody sees something different, right? I, I saw a uterus. <laughs> <laughs> all of them look like a uterus to me. They all do, right? <laughs> okay. 
Oh, wow. A bear, a couple of bears. Yeah. I think with funny heads, but yeah. they look like bears to me. Yeah. Yeah. They do, actually. I see a, a castle and a dragon. Ooh. That's got a castle in it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last one. Oh, this one. Oh. Hmm. Goodness. I see a shield, like some sort mm. of like a, you know, like those shields. Your coat of arms. Coat of arms, yes. Thank mm. you. Yeah. That's beautiful. Now, is anyone going to interpret why I see those things? No. Right now? Just, we <laughs> don't even know. We, we, literally, we literally had a couple on here, and they, they did all five, and, and they, they, they just got married. Uh -huh. They're newlyweds, yeah. and they both gave three consecutive answers that they said at the same time the same thing. Wow. And I was like, that's oh, great. only known each other seven months, and we're married for a week. Yeah. Wow, they're yeah. so connected. <laughs> it was confirmation. Yeah. See how fast Corey cried. We'll show you the clip. Oh. <laughs> Um, um, that's great. And by the way, what we'll do is when we string 25 together of all the different people, and then we'll have a psychiatrist go through and make you a diagnosis of yes. everybody. That's well, maybe a psychiatrist is watching right now. Yeah. If you message us. <laughs> I know. Say, I'll tell you what, that host and her psychic, they're crazy. I know, right? Um, the last question is, uh, who is, I know who, I, who is mine, but uh, who's your celebrity crush? Oh, who's my celebrity crush? Goodness. Well, as of late... You know, it changes depending on who I see. It's got to be Keanu. Oh, Keanu Reeves. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Has He's to be. great. He's a great guy. I, and I think part of that is because I saw him in an interview recently about, um, I mean, it was an old interview, but mm -hmm. he was talking about his former girlfriend yes. who had died. Yeah. And uh, they asked him some question about, like, you know, what do you think about, mm -hmm. you know, death? And do, what do you believe about death? Is there a heaven or whatever? And uh, he said something very raw and honest, and I think he just said what came to mind. And he said, you know, just going to miss them a mm -hmm. lot, mm -hmm. missing her a lot. Like, And that's so true. It's true. That's um, real. Corey's friend, Jay Thomas, Jay Davis, was on the Davis. show. And we'll send you a link to the clip. He was the manager of their band, Dog, Dog Star. Dog Star. Keith Kranigrew's band, Dog oh, Star. Oh, really? And he, gives, he was the manager for a couple of weeks, and he did something really stupid. Oh. Uh, but it's, it's one of the funniest stories It really is funny. Had. Yeah. And, so, and I'll tell you, we hung out with Kenny. You did? Um, is he a nice guy? I've never he, met him, so he's I hope he's nice. He's really, really so oh, very nice. So and glad. he's so humble. Yes. And he's so kind. Yes. I know, and, and he's... Got roots back to Hawaii, of course. He does, yes. Um, and so I think we, so I would love to meet Keanu. <laughs> yes, yes. I know. That would be kind of a nice, I mean, yeah. Because you guys have gone through, what's huh? that? I don't know if he's still talking to Jay. Oh, over two weeks, the, the <laughs> two-weeker. It's um, hilarious. He booked, without giving it away, he booked them for a show, which was really not where they should have been. Oh. And it's, yeah. well, we'll send oh, you a link interesting. to it. It's yeah. very, very funny. Oh, it was would, pretty funny. I would love that. It was pretty funny. Um, uh -huh. I, I've never done this before on the show, but I'm feeling really prompted right now. And it's not a hot flash, but I'm really feeling prompted <laughs> to do this. And I'm sorry. And if you don't want to, we can what? totally no. edit this out. But no, of course. I just feel like I, I want to pray with you. Oh, I would love that. If that's okay. Yes, of course. Yeah, can we do that? Yes, I never um, turned down. Okay, okay. never turned so, down a prayer. And, and whether you <laughs> edit it out or not, that's okay. And we'll we'll end on this preface. But um, thank you. Don't risk a lightning strike by editing. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> you mind if I said no? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Oh, let's pray. Let's pray. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you first and foremost for this beautiful. Um, divine appointment here today, Lord. Uh, your word says that when two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst, but when there's a quarter three, it cannot be broken. And there are three in this room right now. And so Father, I just lift up Maria and Gus to you. And I ask that you continue to guide them and comfort them. And I place a hedge of protection around them. And you are the author of our days and our ways. You know, our plan and our purpose. And you are certainly, um, in and of uh, Maria's purpose with this book. And so, God, I thank you that you will take it to the right people. And I just thank you for her willingness to come on the show today and be so vulnerable and um, candid. And so, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. And I, I lift Maria up and I ask that you heal her body. Um, mm -hmm. And I thank you, God, uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, I want to end on... Um, your preface in your book and uh, I want to say thank you for coming today you blessed me in more ways than one and Bob I know and um, you're a gift oh, you really are thank you. your heart is so huge and so thank you thank um, you. you said uh, to I can't see now because my eyes are filling up with tears but um, 
to Sean David uh, Gerard Alo- Aloysius. Aloysius. That's a nickname, yeah. White Sail. Thank you for loving me, for always um, believing in me. And um, I literally can't see because I have tears in my eyes. Um, for telling me all those years there was a writer in me, too. You were right. I will never stop loving you. Uh, this is for you. Uh, the book is called You Can't Do It Alone, A Widow's Journey Through Loss, Grief, and Life After by Maria Quiban White Self. Uh, I love you and thank you for coming you. today. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so happy to have met you today. You are my soul sister. <laughs> yeah. And we're out. Hi guys, I'm Corey Oliver and thank you for watching The Corey Ellis Effect. We hope you enjoyed the previous episode. Here are some more episodes you might enjoy. Hit the subscribe button below and have a great day.